Wait, is that apologist Sean McDowell? Why is... what? Is that a policeman? No, Sean! What, what, what did you do? Why, why is... Oh, oh. I wonder, what else could the apostles have done to convince us of the depth of the sincerity of their beliefs? If pretending that the hallways of the Bible college where he teaches are a police station doesn't convince you of Christianity, what more can Sean do? Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're new to the channel, please take a second to tap on the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos come out. Recently, I decided to dig deeper and examine the historical evidence that the apostles actually died as martyrs. This is Sean very much underselling himself. The historicity of the martyr claims was the topic of his PhD thesis at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in 2014. That doctorate work became the basis of his book, The Fate of the Apostles, examining the martyrdom accounts of the closest followers of Jesus. Possibly the most comprehensive examination of this topic in many years. I reference it relatively frequently, primarily because... Have you ever heard the argument that the apostles of Jesus all died brutal deaths, being stabbed to death, skinned alive, crucified? And therefore, they didn't make up the resurrection, and Christianity must be true. I heard an argument quite similar to this growing up, and found it quite compelling. As did I. So much so, that as I was losing my faith, this was one path that I insisted upon going down personally. Of course, the obvious hole in the claim is... What about all the other people throughout history who've been willing to die for their beliefs? In fact, what about modern-day Muslim terrorists who die for their faith? Does that mean Islam is true? Excellent point. Well taken. And the well-trained Christian will rejoin her. But the apostles were eyewitnesses. They saw the risen Jesus with their own eyes. So if we conclude that they made it up, we'd have to say that they died for something that they knew was false. And that's difficult to believe. Hmm. If we were to put this line of thinking into syllogism form, it would go something like this. One, people who die for beliefs are sincere. Two, an eyewitness to an event can know if the event claims are false. Three, apostles were eyewitnesses that Jesus rose from the dead. Four, apostles died for their belief that Jesus rose from the dead. And five, therefore, the apostles were sincere in belief that Jesus rose from the dead and could know if Jesus rose from the dead. There is, of course, much to say about all of these, but it is this fourth point that is the topic of Sean's work, and presumably this video. So let's see where this goes. Here are five key points of what I found. The first point to understand is what is meant by an apostle. I'm a big advocate of defining terms, so this is a great start. Apostle is a particularly slippery word because even in the New Testament, it has multiple meanings depending on the context. When we look at the beginning chapters of Acts, we see that the disciples are coming up with a replacement because of Judas who had betrayed Jesus. And there's two criteria that they utilize. One, the replacement had to have been with Jesus since his baptism by John the Baptist. And second, the replacement to be in the Twelve had to be an eyewitness of the risen Jesus. For the author of Luke and Acts, the word apostle applies almost exclusively to the original Twelve, not to eyewitnesses in general. In fact, in the very passage Sean is referring to here, it separates Mary, Jesus' brothers, and everyone else from the word apostle. Only the eleven disciples and the newly chosen Matthias, can have this title in the start of Acts. Later, Barnabas is included as well, starting the inclusion of apostles who weren't the Twelve. Paul of Tarsus further dilutes it, applying the apostle term to himself. He also calls James brother of Jesus an apostle, when the author of Luke specifically excludes James. Paul calls Andronicus, Junius, Epaphroditus, Apollos, and even generally just brothers by the term. For Paul... There are so many apostles floating around, he has to warn against false ones. By the time we get to the end of the first century, the Didache is using apostle as purely synonymous with nameless missionaries. To add to the confusion, Jesus himself is called an apostle in Hebrews 3.1. The point is that it's a fuzzy word. And if Sean is willing to say that only those who personally witnessed resurrected Jesus should be considered apostles for this discussion, that's very helpful. 
be on the lookout for anyone who wants to expand apostle beyond this meaning in this argument. The second point is to understand that the earliest message that the apostles preached was that Jesus had risen from the grave. From the letters of Paul to the book of Acts. Just for a point of reference, the letters of Paul were written 20 years after Jesus' death and the book of Acts another 20 years after that. I'm not disputing that resurrection was part of the early tradition, but these sources are decades after the fact. Where we see the first Christians going out and building the church, the message that they gave was always tied to the resurrection. There is no early Christianity apart from the belief that Jesus rose from the grave. Okay, well that's like saying there's no early Mormonism apart from Joseph Smith finding the golden plates or no early Islam without a revelation to the prophet Muhammad. That the first believers believed is the story of all religions. But few would say that all religions are based on actual events. I'm not sure how this adds to Sean's point. The third point is that the apostles preached a message in direct opposition to the Roman state. When the apostles stood up and said that Jesus is God, they were essentially saying that Caesar is not. Well, not really. Ancient Rome was polytheistic and tended to absorb all the gods of all the regions they conquered. One entity being a god didn't deprive another entity of also being a god. There were many. Declaring Jesus to be a political king would have been a bigger threat. They were proclaiming that a criminal against the Roman state was the risen Lord. They preached a message that made them enemies of the Roman state. Christianity as an ideology or an identity wasn't made illegal in Rome until 303 AD, and that for a historically brief mere 10 years, followed shortly thereafter by becoming the official religion. The point is, in the first several hundred years, no, Christians weren't enemies of the state because of their message of a risen Jesus. The early persecution was tied to charges of disorderly conduct. They were disliked because they were no longer offering up the right sacrifices to the gods who controlled the weather. If the persecution under Nero was to be believed, it was because Christians were an easy scapegoat to frame to cover his tracks in setting a fire. Put off Tarsus is under my watch. The man responsible for burning down Rome. He's nothing but Nero's scapegoat. <laughs> it was not ideological. Were some early Christians sporadically persecuted? Yes. Were they enemies of the state? No. And the fourth point is that the apostles would not stop preaching the risen Jesus, even when they were threatened, beaten, and thrown in prison. Okay. So here's the time where we would want Sean to get more specific. Which apostles were preaching? How do we know? Which were being threatened? Which were being beaten? Which were being thrown into prison? How do we know? If you look at the beginning of the book of Acts, they are told by the religious leaders, just stop proclaiming that Jesus is Lord and we'll leave you alone. But they refuse. They refuse to stop saying that Jesus has risen from the grave. All right, so that's in the book of Acts, written by the author of the Gospel of Luke. This is the claim. If we accepted this author purely at his word, we would simply believe the resurrection, and we wouldn't need to be having this discussion in the first place. No. What we're looking for now is some other confirmation for this story. Sadly, this story isn't even recorded in multiple locations within the New Testament. As far as evidence goes, this is For the Bible Tells Me So. In fact, in Acts chapter 5, Peter stands up when they're being threatened and he speaks on behalf of the apostles. He says we can't. We must obey God rather than men. Same thing. Regardless of whether we accept some of the later grisly apocryphal accounts about the deaths of the apostles. That's the most important thing Sean has said so far. And it's hugely telling. Let's hear that again. Regardless of whether we accept some of the later grisly apocryphal accounts about the deaths of the apostles. With this sentence, Sean is admitting the major conclusion I got from his book on the fate of the apostles. The idea that the apostles died violent deaths comes solely from later accounts. Apocryphal accounts, where apocryphal means of doubtful authenticity, although widely circulated as being true. Sean doesn't outright say that you shouldn't believe them, but he's clearly warning that no Christian should rest their case on them. Sean has spent years studying disciple death legends, and the nicest thing he can do 
is brush them under the carpet and tell us they're not important. What we know for sure is that all the apostles were willing to suffer and die for their belief that Jesus had conquered the grave. Wait, we know for sure that all the apostles were willing to suffer and die. How do we know for sure that the apostles were willing to suffer and die? I mean, the four places in the Bible where the twelve are listed don't even agree on the names. So it takes some tap dancing to even figure out who it is we're tracking. Sean's own book posits that there may have been some rotation of members or something. To be clear, while I'm not at all saying they didn't exist, the mere historicity of the twelve is so weak that Sean's book has to rely on the criteria of embarrassment and a survey of frequency distribution of first century Jewish names as his only evidential markers that they were a group at all. This is not good. Again, per Sean's book, when it comes to descriptions of the ministries of the Twelve, the historical value of the individual sources undoubtedly varies, and do disagree over the particulars of some of the apostles' lives. Of course, Sean advocates for some kernel of truth that the disciples all left Jerusalem to live undocumented lives. But even if we grant this giant leap, how does all the twelve left town equate to we know for sure that all of the apostles were willing to suffer and die? It's not documented. Their impact was so unimportant, the letters of Paul don't mention them. The letters attributed to Peter don't mention them. Even if we take the Bible at its word, that the twelve were willing to suffer and die is pure conjecture not a historically supported fact. If you doubt me, read Sean's book. Even so, once Sean finishes up his last point, we're going to return to this willing to suffer downgrade. And the fifth point is that there is good historical evidence that at least some of the apostles actually died as martyrs. I'm using Sean's focus on the few he believes he has good evidence for as my cue to not waste your time walking through all the apostles without good evidence. Thomas, Andrew, James son of Zebedee, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, or Matthias. We don't know what happened to these characters, and we certainly don't know for sure that they died, or that they were even willing to suffer. And before we get too far... I think it's fair to remind everyone of my criteria for martyrdom for resurrected Jesus. First, the person claimed to have witnessed resurrected Jesus. Second, the person had a chance to save their lives by recanting. And third, rather than recant, they chose to die. That seems pretty basic, right? I go into all of the detailed evidence presented in significantly greater detail in a video called Did Disciples Die? Saying Jesus Rose in response to Mike Winger, that I'll link above and in the description. Okay, we're ready. Bring on the good evidence. Take James, the brother of Jesus, for example. There's an account from Josephus, a Jewish writer, at the end of the first century. And in that account, we learn that a high priest called Ananus had a bad temper and some kind of personal grudge against James. One day, when the procurator was out of town, Ananus took the opportunity to fabricate some charges against James and have him stoned to death. That's not the kind of situation where James would have been given a chance to recant. It was a political murder, not ideological. Not a martyrdom. Take James, the brother of John. There's an evidence, a recording of his death in Acts 12.2 at the hands of Herod. King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. That's the whole story. Doesn't sound like Herod cared about his specific beliefs at all. And there are multiple pieces of evidence, different documents, pointing out from the 1st and 2nd century that both Peter and Paul died as martyrs. Since Sean is compressing the nuance of his most complicated historical argument into a single sentence, I'll point you to my Did Disciples Die Saying Jesus Rose video for my full treatment on it, but leave you with the highlights that the multiple different documents are highly problematic in that none of them agree with each other on even the smallest detail and come from the same kind of sources Sean earlier dismissed as apocryphal. Even if we are charitable to all of it, Peter and Paul died under Nero, whom we're led to believe wanted to kill Christians as a cover for his own crime of arson, not because he cared in the least about their ideology, 
and no opportunities to recant are recorded. And there is no evidence that any of the apostles recanted their beliefs. But as I was just saying, there's no evidence of any of the apostles being given an opportunity to recant. So we're basically at an impasse on this one. But you also can't argue they died for their beliefs without establishing that the reason they died was their beliefs. This alone doesn't prove that Christianity is true, but it does show the depth of the sincerity of the apostles. They weren't making the story up. They weren't liars. This wasn't a big conspiracy. They were willing to suffer and die for their belief that Jesus had risen from the grave. Okay, so we're back to Sean's bait and switch that being willing to suffer is just the same as being killed. Let's take another look at the resurrection argument syllogism, replacing dying with willing to suffer, and see how we do. Wait, does that first one look right to you? People who are willing to suffer are sincere? Are they? What does willing to suffer even mean in this context? I mean, is willing to suffer basically knowledge that the consequences of one's actions could potentially lead to suffering? Would you say that a thief who is aware of the law is willing to go to jail? Would you say that a smoker who is aware of the risks is willing to get lung cancer? Not at all. People take risks all the time, hoping to be in the group that avoids the negative consequences. The whole gravitas of the apostle martyr stories with the grisly details is that the finality of violent death was supposed to be the security of the sincerity. I've been binging forensic files on Netflix recently, and all of those murderers thought that they would escape charges. And only once they are caught and at the point of facing life in prison or the death penalty would they then change their tune in order to save themselves. When Sean's years of investigation into these martyr claims turned up unconvincing, the weight of the argument went with it. This willing-to-suffer version doesn't do much to establish sincerity. It was the alleged life-and-death decision that was convincing to me. And even then... It's only Peter and Paul who can meaningfully be said to have both believed to have seen resurrected Jesus and have been participating in any activity for which they might have been willing to suffer. Only Peter and Paul. Paul and Peter. So here is where I start to connect the dots with the what-if challenge for Christians that I issued last month, which asked, What aspect of current church history becomes impossible if Peter and Paul were the only people that resurrected Jesus actually appeared to. According to this video by Sean and his book and PhD dissertation, the only reliable accounts of actual martyrdom within my generous criteria, or even the watered-down willing-to-suffer version, comes down to just Peter and Paul. Sean's findings are entirely consistent with my hypothesis. Therefore, no resurrection hypothesis need account for anything more than the sincerity of two men. James, the Twelve, the Women, the Five Hundred, they're all unevidenced window dressing that merely serve as a distraction from the magician's sleight of hand. This is not juggling! This is called misdirection! And how do I account for the sincerity of Peter and Paul? Tap on the thumbnail for How Christianity Probably Started to find out or check out my detailed martyr breakdown to show my work on these conclusions. Until next time, later.